So I think that this, for a topic as interesting as software-defined networking, this has been a remarkably uh, uncontentious or controversial uh, meeting. And so what I plan to do in a short period of time is interject a whole bunch of contention and controversy, partly because I think I'm, I'm that kind of ordinary person, but partly because I think that there are a bunch of important issues. And we focus a lot here on agreement, and I'm going to focus on where I think there ought to be disagreement or pursuit of different points of view. So let me start by uh, answering the question of why should you care about what my opinion is anyway. I mean, an analyst. What is an analyst? I'm, I think I'm the only person here that doesn't have a PhD, so you might say, well, that, that will define how we deal with your input. <laughs> but I, I, I was working on a PhD before I did other things. So the Internet Research Group is a boutique firm in Los Altos. Boutique is a polite word for small. We do market research and strategy consulting, and we focus working with companies um, on the interesting question of how you make money out of new technology. But, so my comments are all going to be addressed at this question, independently of this being intellectually interesting. How do you uh, make money on it? We have been working for 15 years on the intersection between networks and systems, which is exactly what this is, and we specialize in these disruptive markets, which are simply markets where the answer isn't obvious. So that's, we specialize in having opinions, but helping companies sort of understand how to make mark, uh, money in these circumstances. Who am I? Uh, in a, a distant century, I was in fact a, uh, an OS programmer and, and a designer. I had run <coughs> large software organizations before I realized that I'm probably genetically incompatible with large political organizations. <laughs> um, I've been involved with ne networking for a long time, since the birth of DECnet. I've sort of always tried to keep it as a distance. Other people today, in the last couple of days, have said networking is an un has often in the past been an unfulfilling thing to do because it's so complicated. Um, I don't actually know anything, I don't think anymore, but I know I'm one step removed. I have an amazing network of friends who are still wanting to talk to me, and they really know a lot. So I'm, I'm one step removed from an, an interesting collection of information, and I try and do, do a good job of, of proxying those points of view through. Um, for the last 10 years, I've worked at this boundary of networks and systems. I think I'm fairly unique in being at least enough bi bilingual to be able to go to, to, DEC, to, to Cisco and talk about networking or to go to Sun and talk about systems and understand the discussion across it. So my journey with OpenFlow began a little over a year ago when my friend Simon Crosby asked me if I ever heard about it. I hadn't, but it sounded like a fun topic. And it was a perfect analyst topic, and this is a picture of, of uh, Diogenes, who of course is set out with his lantern in search of an honest man. With OpenFlow, what I've been able to do is go to a diverse collection of people who should have an opinion on OpenFlow and simply ask them, so what do you think about OpenFlow? And it's a completely non-leading non question. I didn't say, do you think, do you agree with my opinion of OpenFlow, and over this period of time, I've gotten a really rich and diverse um, set of opinions. So you can sort of say a complex textured 360 degree view of the, the problem. And again, my focus has always been on this simple but crass perspective of, I don't care how elegant it is, I don't care how intellectually pleasing it is, how can you make money, and try to answer two questions, which is, one, how do you make money based on software-defined networking or open flow? And how is this going to disrupt the existing network business? How does this change the, the balance of power? So my conclusions to date, I mean, I may really am intellectual. I, I love system theory and design. And I completely believe that software-defined networking will revolutionize the way we do networking in a way that has been said repeatedly. I, I fully understand um, how SDM has already, or SDM-like concepts, changed how the large, the mega-scale web operators do uh, networking. So I'm, I'm, I'm aware of its impact. I understand the impact that software-defined networking can and will have on the research community and how that can enable the, the practical output of research. But I, when I look at how this impacts the enterprise network business, I'm still puzzled. I'm, I'm getting old, I may be confused, I may not be able to follow the arguments, but 
I think there's real problems. Not, not problems in something that will never happen, but problems that have to be overcome in order for software-defined networking to really uh, influence enterprise computing. <clears throat> Why do I care? Why should you care? Because the enterprise is the biggest part of the networking business. So again, if you're interested in going where the money is, you better look at enterprise networking. Um, The reason it's a challenge, I mean, if you just stand back for a moment and say, why should it be difficult to inject software-defined networking into the enterprise, the answers are very much on the surface. Um, in the beginning, some of the proponents of, of uh, software-defined networking, oops, I have a new microphone myself, talked about a world in which you radically disrupt the economics of the enterprise by moving from high-value network devices to commodity white box network devices built by ODMs. I mean, that's in a sense what the, the Verizon argument is. We've got to, to squeeze a lot of money out. That's why it's attractive to, um, to Google. But if, I guarantee you, if you go to anyone in the net, today's networking business and say, what do you think about taking all the, the value out of hardware and turning it into something that looks like the server business, no one, no one gets warm and fuzzy. Even if you don't take that radical step, and even if you say what we're looking at is a transfer of value from hardware to software, that's one of the most challenging, I don't know, I only know of one company that has a good approach to that, and that's EMC, and EMC knows how to transfer value between hardware and software, because they're a hardware company that owns a very successful software company and derives most of its market value from the value in its software company. So over time, they can toss things over the boundary, but. It's a question that Sun struggled with for years. It's a question that Cisco has struggled with for years. It's a very basic question. To talk to a sales guy about how do you think about a, a, a relationship with your customer where you drop a box off and then wait until they want to order something else to you sell them software that they have to use every month for you to get paid. It's, it, it's not an easy thing to do at the best. And finally, from as a OS, designer in the distant past and somebody that knows distributed computing, building a SDM controller that's reliable enough to run an enterprise network on is a really interesting, challenging technical decision. So all of a sudden you're moving from this remarkable Baroque network system that we use today to something that's clean and elegant, but whoever builds that software has the opportunity to bring the entire enterprise down at once, one, one programming mistake. So when I've, I've thought about it, it's, it's something that's probably like enterprise storage. I mean, you can do it, you can deliver high value, but you really have to get the design right. Networking is really complicated. So if you talk about, I'm gonna produce the equivalent of existing functionality in an SDM environment, I think that's also very difficult. Most people don't understand how complicated networks are, except for the people that work at places like Cisco or Juniper and have to create the software and make it work. More importantly, customers don't value companies spending time taking functionality that already works and purposing it into a, another technology. I think Sun discovered that with SunOS to Solaris. DEC discovered that with uh, DEC System 10 to, to, to 10X. I mean, you can do that. You can decide to go from one version to another, but if you don't deliver functionality to your customers for a couple of years, they don't reward you. And finally, there have been very few killer apps. I mean, with new technology, usually what launches new technology uh, into the world is you find something that you can do something you really want to do, but it requires a new technology. And those examples don't really exist. Most of what's talked about today is is interesting, it's incremental, it builds on existing network, but it doesn't say, boy, this knocks your socks off. So I want to uh, um, inject a little specific controversy quickly. I want to do these three topics. I want to talk about the, this horizontal um, issue. This is more aimed at the, at the research and academic community. I want to talk briefly about open source. I want to talk about DevOps and then tie it together on the enterprise. We, we had this nice chart earlier which said we used to live in a hideous world of the IBM mainframe and we had proprietary hardware, proprietary OS, proprietary apps, and we have freed ourselves from them. It may be true, but what's the, the, the tech company of the highest value and greatest in, innovation who is currently reforming the world? I think it's Apple. <laughs> 
people with your iPads. It's an A5, a proprietary CPU, with a proprietary optimized OS running proprietary apps. So is it really the horizontal? Uh, horizontal is a good idea, but it's not magic. If you don't like that one, keep the private cloud with VMware, VBlocks, VMware proprietary apps. So if you don't like that, look at Google, proprietary hardware, proprietary stack, proprietary apps. May not be a magic thesis. O open source, and this is a message, I guess, into the, the community. Open source is really good for the people who constitute the Open Networking Foundation. It's really good for people that can't afford expensive software, research, academia. It's really good for the biggest companies that support it totally and, and don't pay for it, but they own the operation. Open source doesn't by itself easily deliver value to the mid-range. That's where the, how you monetize it is a really interesting um, question. I would argue that network systems aren't like getting a version of Linux. It's much more complicated. Um, and I would also argue that open source historically has worked well where the definition was clear, whether it's Unix or web server or GFS and MapReduce into Hadoop, and historically open source hasn't worked well as a vehicle for innovate, clean innovation. DevOps, if you, you've heard the word today, DevOps is the magic word, world by which all the large web operators exist. It's really cool, and the idea is you don't have an ops team and a dev team, it's all together. Um, it means you have really bright engineers that solve problems at any level in the stack. That's one of the, the magic of Google or Facebook. Really smart system people who can solve a problem without regard to what level they're working on. Continuous introduction of functionality. The point I'm making is this is not going to happen in the enterprise. And it's a longer discussion, but it won't happen because if you look at the enterprise value chain, how IT technology gets to the enterprise. By the time it gets there, you don't have bright system engineers. They're way back up in the chain. You have people that can deal with the assumptions of the vendors that sold the technology. It is stupid, would be stupid for most enterprises to go to a DevOps model because it all of a sudden makes it critical that you hire really good people to run your IT operations. Most enterprises don't know how to hire the people and certainly couldn't retain them. I'm getting the, the chain. Uh, so what I wanted to do was to, to simply do one chart here that says, if you look at the structure of ONF and the structure of software-defined networking, and you look at how the enterprise fits into these other areas, ONF really aims, is populated by and aims from the research community and also the large operators, but the, the characteristics of those markets are very different from the characteristics of the enterprise. If you want to address the enterprise market, you have to recognize it's not the same, it's not going to be the same. And my particular conclusion is software, I really like Jen's talk because she started to talk about what a software stack really looks like. When I read it from my good advice on how to make money, I'd say we're about a year away minimally from having some research prototypes from which people would start to build commercial products. But there's so much interesting work to be done in the software to solve the enterprise problem. Okay. With that, I